One of the biggest advantages of humans is our capacity to find solutions for every problem that comes along the way. The scientific method has allowed humans to go far beyond any expectations. Advances in all scientific fields help us understand the world much better, allowing us to predict future events and change circumstances never imagined before. The advances in chemistry are a great example of this. In agriculture, to sustain the constantly growing population, scientists developed the powerful weapons against the pests attacking our crops to keep producing the food that we eat. But just like Peter Parker's uncle, Ben famously told Spider-Man, with great power come great responsibility. A new chemical has the power to save and improve lives, but under the wrong conditions, the same chemical can also be deadly. It is our responsibility to create the best protocols to ensure how and under which conditions a new chemical should and should not be used. I'm sure you are aware of incidents from the past when chemical companies basically self-regulate themselves regarding the safety of a new chemical. A lot of things have changed in the regulatory process, but it's far from perfect, especially when you're talking about protecting pollinators. The first step of the regulatory process to evaluate the safety of a new chemical for pollinators is to test its toxicity under laboratory conditions. In this phase, the new compound is delivered to adult worker bees in cages and larvae in petri dishes in two ways, topically and orally. Then the short-term lethal dose 50 LD50, which is the amount of chemical necessary to kill 50% of the individuals, is calculated. This serves as the baseline to determine if a new chemical is toxic or not to pollinators. In this first phase, we already have many problems to discuss. First, did you know that only honeybees are tested? We don't need a degree to understand the logic behind this. We have thousands of different species of pollinators out there. They are different from each other, belonging to different biological families with distinct biologies and ways of living. It is not a surprise that when you test a new chemical agent against one single species of bees, you are not covered potential damage to other species. This is a terrible assumption. Another problem is that honeybees are social insects. Social bees are not the rule but rather the exception in nature. There are many more solitary bee species than social bee species in the world. Therefore, when you test a new chemical against something rare, you are excluding the majority of the bee species from the equation. Second, it is a short-term test, meaning that exposure is measured only for around 10 days. Honeybees live longer than that, and there is cumulative exposure that is not taken into consideration when evaluating risk. There is no evaluation on the reproductive system of honeybees, for example. To create problems, a new chemical doesn't necessarily need to kill a bee. To make a population disappear without killing them, you only need to make the species reproduce less and less. If the chemical for some reason affects the reproductive system of the honeybees, for example, affecting the honeybee queen without killing her, the chemical will pass the test and be approved for use. Consequently, thousands of honeybee hives will slowly disappear without dead bees to tell a story. Does that ring the bell? The next step in the regulatory process are very disturbing in my personal opinion. But before we jump into it, I want to say thank you to Vita Bee Health for sponsoring this video. Vita is the only company dedicated to honeybee health products, and you can find several products to fit your beekeeping style. Please check them out, link in the description of this video. I believe it is not too much to assume that after laboratory tests, chemicals should pass tests in the field mimicking some of the real-life conditions we have. However, to my surprise, that important phase is not mandatory, as you can see in the figure here. After estimating exposure from the model, many chemicals go straight to risk management to evaluate short-term economics. And if the numbers are good, done. The new chemical is approved. In other cases, depending on the chemical, I believe, honeybee colonies are sprayed in outdoor cages and later on in open field. That sounds good, right? Well, after a little digging, 
I found out that this is not a reliable test because they used the new chemical in its pure form only. This is not the final product containing other chemicals and adjuvants that sometimes are more dangerous than the chemical itself. Not only that, this test overlooks the most important part of a safety test in my view, the potential interaction with other chemicals already in the field. Perhaps this is the part that I have more problems with. Synthetic pesticides, being human-made and not naturally occurring, have the potential to react with several other substances. The greatest concern is an unknown combination that could be lethal not only to bees but to any life form. For instance, we now know that the combination of neonicotinoids with some fungicides can disrupt the detoxification pathway of not just honeybees but insects in general. Once a chemical is found to have harmful non-target effects, it is typically banned after a long and expensive process. This is a deadly cycle where the real experimentation occurs after the product is approved. It is basically like this. Let's do some tests in the lab. Sometimes tests in the field but not frequently because it's too expensive. Then, if the economics are okay, let's release it to the world and see what happens. If something drastic happens and people and scientists start to complain, then we took a look and ban it. This is basically what it is, unfortunately. The cycle repeats itself with a new chemical undergoing the same flooded tests and release it without proper care. So how do we solve this problem? A group of concerned scientists decide to meet and discuss this topic and propose a solution for it. And the results of this work were published in the prestigious journal Bioscience. I had the pleasure of speaking to one of the authors, Dr. Adrian Fisher II, on my podcast. Link in the description. Regulation of pesticides is a complicated issue. From the economic perspective, on one hand, you need to empower farmers with the right tools to be competitive in a complex marketplace with a lot of unfair competition from products generated in other countries with almost zero regulation. On the other hand, you must also ensure that the new tools won't harm non-target organisms, potentially hurting other markets and making the country as a whole much weaker. The EPA is relatively young and has had its ups and downs. The regulatory process, as it stands, makes no sense to me, and I believe it's time to reevaluate this process. This deadly cycle is also not good for pesticide companies. With an appropriate regulatory process, companies won't have their product banned and could benefit from the profit of good and safe products. A good and fair regulatory process is a positive thing, unless this is designed to beneficiate the pesticide companies, but I will leave this rabbit hole for you to go in. I would like to thank my members for their support, and if you want to check my conversation with Dr. Fisher and find out the proposed solution for this problem, please click right here. Thanks for watching. Inside the Hive.tv, the show about beasts. See you guys next week.